uh, I really want to welcome all of you, dear friends, uh, to the 10th edition of the She Leader in a Shell. In uh, the Women's March Month, uh, we decided to invite uh, uh, in the, uh, this special edition a male leader, and this is uh, Alex Popov. And uh, before starting the dialogue with him, I want to introduce him with a couple of words. Uh, Alex has 20 years of experience in the software industry and a very strong track of record as a leader in the tech teams. Uh, Alex uh, now leads the Uber engineering team in Sofia uh, for a little bit more than two years. And uh, the site, uh, um, you may know, but uh, maybe uh, still to share it, uh, uh, the local site in Sofia builds products that are an integral part of the critical uh, infrastructure of the Uber platform. So from Bulgaria, um, the, the team delivers uh, what we are using everywhere, but in Bulgaria. Uh, when we are traveling, when we can travel. And uh, for these two years, uh, uh, the team uh, grew up four times. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, on one hand, uh, a commitment of Uber uh, to invest uh, more in uh, a different type of products here, uh, but also is uh, recognition clearly for me uh, for the professional work that the local team under the Alexis leadership uh, uh, has a production. Uh, what uh, Alex did before Uber, uh, he uh, worked in Skyscanner in the UK first, then uh, he co-founded and led the engineering teams uh, of uh, Scanner here in Sofia. And um, uh, also uh, he Again, he has led engineering teams at uh, Kayak in Boston. Uh, he is also very active participants and developer, I would say, in the startup community here in Bulgaria, being mentor of Endeavor Network, and uh, also he is an angel investor. Uh, Alex, I'm extremely happy to have you uh, here tonight. And uh, just to introduce uh, what we'll discuss with Alex uh, so that you have the right expectations. Uh, we will talk about the uh, professional development um, in the perceived as male deep tech field. Uh, as also, uh, hopefully, we'll understand a little bit more about uh, Uber's uh, engineering uh, experience uh, professionally in the product field, but also in attracting women in uh, in the operation. Uh, we will also discuss on how to create an exclusive environment that uh, stimulates the talent of both women and men. Uh, we will talk also about the role of the new generation of uh, male leaders uh, in uh, uh, proactively uh, working uh, for overcoming the stereotypes and prejudices in the ICT uh, field. And um, also, I will try to uh, sneak in uh, in the private uh, world of Alex for you and uh, make him share on uh, how he reconsidered uh, family and parents' role in the pandemic time. So stay with us. Uh, the meeting uh, promises to be very interesting. Uh, you can uh, write your questions uh, in the chat uh, here in WebEx platform uh, or also as a comment on uh, Facebook uh, where we are also uh, live broadcasting uh, this meeting. Um, yeah, Alex, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome with us uh, in the She Leader world. Uh, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here again. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, uh, it's been it's been an honor to 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 help the community, and uh, you probably know. I don't know if anyone knows, but uh, <clears throat> I've been passionate about the topic for quite a while. I have. Uh, I myself am where I am because of women. I can I can give you so many examples of this, and and um, I think though that there's so much more that we can do about it, and it will probably take a lot of time. But but I'm seeing the positive change over the last ten years, that's, maybe, and and I think we're going in the right direction. 
That's a very solid statement for the beginning. Let's uh, see if you will give uh, strong proofs on uh, what you just uh, said. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Alex, uh, you are one of uh, those that uh, until pandemic times uh, stayed for 12 hours in the office to secure on time production of the critical infrastructure uh, for uh, Uber's uh, worldwide platform. And um, I'm saying this because I know you uh, from the uh, era BC, uh, we, we know each other. Uh, tell us how the remote, uh, remote work uh, changed uh, uh, your daily dynamics. Uh, do you see now closer also the home back office? Uh, definitely. Um, I've, I've certainly had uh, my own biases about where the focus of uh, uh, someone in the role should be and, and what and how should our time be invested into, into what we do. Um, also, when the, the whole pandemic situation started, I was extremely, extremely worried, not just of how am I going to deal with this, but, but also the entire team. And, um, and I, I have a simple philosophy about all challenges and, and it's, and it's basically that every challenge presents opportunities, right? So at the time I was uh, both worried, but also thinking, well, what we, what what is it that we can squeeze out of it? Like what what is it that we can get out of this whole situation? And the one thing that I didn't realize probably is that I'm a father of of two kids, um, and my wife is uh, is someone who probably cannot imagine her wife uh, her life uh, without working. She's she's a woman of of her own career. Um, and and we were lucky over time because there was always someone in town who is helping us. Um, but then we both got locked in with the kids at home. Um, and like many other people, we were trying to figure out a way to, to um, not degrade into what we do at work, uh, but also take care of, of, of them as well. Um, and it turned out that it's actually possible, um, not only for me, but for, for most of the people in my team. I've, uh, this is a team that has been growing steadily over the, the last three years. Um, and since 2018, they're, 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 a lot of their performance metrics went up twice, like they, they doubled. Um, and I was extremely worried if that situation will basically degrade the, the state of, of the team, but to my surprise, it was exactly the opposite. Uh, uh, the, we have, at, at the moment, we are performing better than any other time in history of, of the team. And, and so it turned out that it's not just an opportunity to, to, to maybe rethink how we, how we see our professional life versus uh, the life at home. It was obviously a challenge for a lot of people to, to make sure that when we're locked at home, we are separating those, but it also gave me an opportunity to realize how much time that, that I'm spending at the office or traveling to the office, I can actually invest into my family, um, spend with the kids. And then the other thing is that even as you're trying, uh, as you're trying to stay dedicated to work, uh, kids are kids. They, they need what they need and, and you need to drop everything and just take care of them. Right. Um, and. The perception that the, the two things cannot be mixed together or that one or the other will suffer from, from mixing them um, was completely wrong, I think, because we've all seen our colleagues with uh, kids running behind their backs or someone spilling something and they apologize and, and jump and, and start to, 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 to move their focus to, to the family. And I think that also the, the fact that we were all in the same situation made us a lot more tolerant to, to, to each other in, in these situations. And it turned out that you can actually be at home and work and, and, and work quite productively, but also spend a lot more time with the family. For me, that was, that was the brilliant part of 2020. I've, I've probably never spent more time uh, during the week with my kids uh, at, uh, while at the same time working. Um... 
I would suggest you join the next press conference uh, of the um, National Board uh, for Pandemic because uh, uh, next to this caring story is good uh, to uh, also add uh, such a flavor of positive effects of pandemic. Uh, but uh, I understand um, and I'm hearing this from many, many other people and uh, that's uh, uh, really a big gain. Um, coming with the pandemic, but do you think that um, uh, on a sustainable way in the time, uh, this can be a, a effect positively uh, uh, the understanding that there is a need of uh, better uh, share of the uh, family responsibilities and through this to open up uh, space for both women and men to follow their career, dreams, paths, ambition, or just this will be uh, limited in the time when we are forced to be at home? I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. Um, as I said, my wife works and her work is such that she doesn't have the freedom to, to just do it remotely all the time. Um, She's, she's a sound engineer and they were shooting a movie after a movie uh, in 2020 and she needed to be on the set. So um, mom and dad basically switched uh, roles in, at home. Um, I, was, uh, I was taking the kids to school, I was feeding them, I was... Now, and they, and they are alive, right? So uh, obviously it's possible um, and it's very hard at the beginning. But once you find your rhythm, once you uh, set up some rules, mostly for myself, um, the kids are hard to put under specific boundaries, but they learn too. Um, and my kids are not too big. Like my boy is six years old and my girl is 11. Um, so they quickly learn that when they hear me speaking into the room that I use for, for work, um, it's, they should be very, very quiet. Even if, if it's urgent and they need me for something, they, they, they would, uh, um, take care of making sure that it's not too disruptive. Um, but it was also something that basically uh, forced me into into going into a schedule where I know that I cannot have a meeting at 12 because I need to get to feed them basically. Um, and that I can't uh, be at a meeting in uh, at five o'clock because I need to pick them up from school and things like that. So rearranging your schedule uh, and working along with with the people that 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 are part of our work environment to, to be tolerant about their needs and, and about their schedules um, seems to have worked really well for us. And, and as I said, I've, I've never believed that I can be the mom at home for, for months, basically. Um, but it, as I said, like kids have never been in a, in a better shape. I, I, I was really worried as to uh, what will be the outcome of, of all of this. And my family is lucky because we have two grannies in, in town and, and they are helping helping us a lot but with everything that was happening that that using them basically disappeared as an option and, and so it was not tough for me uh and it's not and it wasn't just me who needed to adapt it was also my wife so i i think that it was a great learning experience and it opened my eyes for the fact that uh, we can share certain burdens like the family burden specifically uh, a lot more equally which obviously um is something that that i wouldn't bet money on in in before this whole thing happened but at the end of the day we humans are amazing because we adapt right and so um i'm pretty sure that historically we've adapted to to much harsher uh, conditions so um i'm only sorry that that i didn't try something like that before I was forced into trying something. Don't be sorry, you have many more opportunities to practice what you've learned uh, during the pandemic and uh, uh, as a leader also to stimulate this culture uh, within your team and within your circle of uh, influence. Uh, We'll move to other topics, but just one more question around the children, because uh, that's, uh, in my view, very essential how we grow the next generation. Uh, so uh, what would be your recipe for growing uh, this 
young people at the moment uh, that are uh, just copying uh, uh, the the models for life uh, from our behavior. Uh, how we can grow them um, free of prejudices uh, for the predefined uh, men, women, professional uh, roles, specifically in the digital industry, but also in the society. Uh, and why I'm asking this question, because uh, we uh, share same culture in the bubble, but uh, if you look the bold facts, um, still there are many, many limitations. Um, uh, we live in time where every business is digital, practically, uh, but only 16% uh, of the ICT professionals on European level uh, are women. A bit more in Bulgaria. Bulgaria, is, uh, for those that uh, doesn't know, uh, is a leader in one factor on European level, and that's the number of women in the ICT industries, 28%. And uh, more worrying uh, fact is that only 2% of the world capital supports female-led businesses. So we still have a long way to go. And uh, in my view on uh, how we program the young people today um, pretty much depends uh, if uh, in the future we'll be able to use the whole potential of uh, uh, talented people, no matter if they are women and uh, men. So what is your recipe for uh, growing uh, this uh, that are 10 uh, and 6 years uh, old uh, for uh, this future world? I don't think I have the silver bullet here and I think that uh, there, there's no such thing. So it will probably take many generations to uh, to get there. Uh, but we need to start somewhere and, and how fast we get there depends on how aggressive we are with, with what we do about it, which is one of the reasons why we are all here. Um, one important moment in my life was when my daughter was born and I realized that what a baby is, basically. Um, and I was shocked as to how fast they are learning at such a small age, um, which triggered a bunch of interest in, in, in other fields. Like I've read a lot about how the human brain works and, and a bunch of other things. And when I was going through that material, it's pretty solid scientific material, <clears throat> I was seeing nothing that says anything about uh, gender or race or something else. Our brains are probably the, the, the most exciting computational machine that exists in the world today, and it will probably be the most exciting computational machine that exists for quite a while. Um, and when you look at how things work there, um, you see that it's all about environment and it's all about um, repeating things. So we have billions and billions of neurons and they are grouped into pattern recognizers and there are highways of information transferring electricity in our brain. That's it. And there's no male or female gene involved into all of this. So when, when you're born, your brain is a blank slate, right? You can do whatever you want to do with it if you're cruel enough. Um, but I realized at that moment that actually our biases shape in the environment, in the family, in school, and from, from sort of the, the empirical way we've learned that the first seven years are very important, not because we understand why, but the, the, the science around this advanced so much in the last 10 or 15 years that now we know why. And basically that, that, that led me to, to think that it's up to me, it's up to my wife to, to figure out what we want our kids to be. Um, and me and my wife are very different people. She's, she's this amazing creative person that, is, that has always been in arts and music, and I'm the guy in maths and, and science. And the first thing we decided is that we are not going to try to program them into going into anything right? We, we will figure out how to create a 
good baseline for them to have any opportunity that they want to chase and then leave them to choose. And so they are learning music with, uh, with mom. They are learning how to make movies with mom, but they're also learning math with daddy. And uh, now my girl even is coding. Um, and it's up to us to, 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 to um, negate the negative effect of the society in those children, because the first seven years are great, but you can't teach them very advanced things during those first seven years. Once they start going to school, they suddenly crash with, with the environment and it, the true battle becomes there. Um, because they are but, uh, let me provoke you. Class. Sorry for interrupting you. Is this uh, crushing or it is uh, an adapting? Because uh, we live in certain uh, social context and um, uh, we should have muscles, um, even emotional or uh, being able to translate or even to influence to the society our values. Uh, and uh, this uh, midpoint is very, very critical. And also, I tend to disagree with you that uh, the people are born as tabula rasa, uh, because there is on top of what uh, you all said, uh, DNA, and uh, there is still a difference. Maybe we are moving uh, slowly towards uh, uh, unisex uh, uh, animal or figure, but uh, still there are uh, certain uh, instincts encoded from uh, where we are coming in our um, absolutely in our um, roots and uh, uh, hopefully hopefully uh, we will not uh, lose this authenticity because uh, this helps us to complement each other uh, each other's contribution uh, from a pure feminine and pure uh, male perspective. Uh, and you are fully right that we should not spoil the picture on uh, loading this with the with the prejudices. And I'm uh, uh, trying uh, through this intervention to transit to my next question. Uh, because you, um, you have such a, a big, uh, different uh, managerial experience. Uh, can you share uh, what, is, what are the pros and uh, if any cons uh, uh, in the diverse team? And um, in general, what is your definition of diversity um, so that uh, we also, um, let's say, uh, elevate uh, these uh, thoughts and uh, beliefs on the theme perspective, on the uh, performance perspective. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I'm not saying we are the same. I'm, what, all I'm saying is that anyone can, can build the necessary mental skills to go into any direction they choose. Okay. Um, but that being said, you're right. Uh, there's also genes and those have been uh, developed into certain ways for like a million years now. Um, and there's probably a good reason there are two sexes. I'm not saying that we should remove that. The nature is a, uh, has its own brute force way of uh, getting to the right solution, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think that <clears throat> if we, we, should, we should recognize and use the fact that we're different, okay? Um, I, I can give you multiple examples of, of cases where I needed to fix a team where there was just too much testosterone, basically. Uh, a team that was not working well, and then you put a girl in that team and everything just flows. And it's not because of who that girl is, although I've, I've like my teams are such that we've always kept the bar high, um, but it, it changes the dynamic. It changes how, uh, like, because of the biases we have, we, each, each negative side that we have, uh, whether we are male or female or something else, like whether this is gender or race or religion or, or culture, um, I've always said that changing those things is very hard. But if you channel them properly, if you use them, uh, they can be a powerful weapon. Um, and so 
I believe it is very important that the leader realizes what are the strengths and the weaknesses of, of certain types of character or gender or cultural, uh, uh, the cultural side of things, and basically makes sure that, that they're accelerating and, and boosting the, the, the positive side of, of, of what we have in us and making sure that the negative side is not impacting anyone around the people that, that we work with. Um, and that has worked well in the past for me. Uh, there are just roles where women excel. And I've often said like, there's a huge difference between a team of engineers and an engineering team. Uh, a team of engineers is just that, a manager and his engineers, and they're set up for failure. Um, you need a bunch of support roles. Um, and in some of those roles, women are just way better than men. Um, my, my team doesn't necessarily have 30% women in the, in the cohort of the engineers, uh, but as a whole, we are very close to having 30% of, of the entire engineering team uh, uh, be female. Um, and, and there are other things like we, we keep focusing on, on the gender here. Um, but I've, I've learned from mistakes. I, I, I must admit in, in the past that there are other things that you need to consider. Like for me, we, as a, as a place on earth are blessed because we don't have, uh, a lot of controversy between uh, races, genders, or ethnicities, or, or religion, historically. But there are those places where these things are, have happened and are, and have left their mark on the society. And um, when I, when I, for example, went to Boston, for me, it was a shocker that there's a room, that there's a prayer room. And I've never thought like, I've, I've led teams before that, and I never thought, well, should I provide something like that in the office for, for my teams? Like, um, and, and there are those small things that, that you see here and there, and, and you try to learn. And there's always something like, I've always said, like the biggest enemy of any of us is, is arrogance. Like the moment I, I tell the world, well, my team is the best team and my office is the best office. Um, something's wrong. Things are progressively going in the wrong direction from that point out. So I, on a day to day basis. I try to challenge both myself and my team to think as to what we are missing. Um, is, is there anyone in the team who doesn't feel comfortable and why, and how to, how to remove the, the, the reasons for that. So in terms of, of, uh, diversity, we should probably look beyond the gender. Um, the other piece here is that, um, I would recommend to anyone to, to experience the other side. Um, and there are many ways to, to, to do that. Um, I've, I've had the, the pleasure and honor to work for some really amazing companies, but, but most of them were companies that are based in either Western Europe or the United States. And there are biases there as well for people from Eastern Europe. And, um, I've seen people say, oh, the engineers in India uh, are uh, not good engineers and things like that. And then you end up in that environment and you're suddenly part of the minority. Yeah, like you're one of those engineers that need to prove themselves twice as much to, to gain the respect and the trust of, of your colleagues. And, and that opens your mind that, that basically creates the perspective of, um, is there something I'm missing? Are there people that feel like I feel in, in this situation? Um, and, and it requires a bit of a mental strength and, and to, and not everyone has that. So, so we as leaders, it's, it's our job to make sure that we are creating a safe environment where we are creating equal opportunities for everyone. And, and it's the job of the organization to, to support us into, into creating those, those opportunities and, and those environments. Some of them are easy to put in place and some of them require strategic thinking and investment, uh, from, from the organizations that we work for. So I think that first of all, it's very important to to create visibility around those things, to not let people learn from their mistakes because that hurts someone, um, at a very early stage, uh, with, with a lot of the startups that I work with diversity and, and, and the safe environment is, is rarely something in the mind of a, of a young founder. Right. Um, and 
but you need to prime them for the moment where they will hit the inflection point where they will need to start thinking about that. And the earlier they start to do that, the better. Now, the larger organizations obviously have the resources and have the experience to, to put a lot of good things in place to, to make people feel comfortable, but there's always something that, that is missing. The, the people who are designing all those things, they too have biases. They too come from a specific background. They are sometimes missing the picture. Um, so I, I, I just think that we constantly need to stay vigilant and critical to ourselves and, and to think about how to, how to create those opportunities all the time. Ne never be complacent about where we are and uh, how great is what we've created so far in, in that sense. Um, I fully agree with you. I personally have same experience because um, when I was um, uh, managing the HP's operation here, we've opened the first near shore center and uh, it was um, initially quite an effort, uh, HP had told to see Bulgaria because of uh, what you said uh, earlier. And then uh, once building up the uh, initial Actually, the first two years were very critical uh, to build up the reputation and the image. But once you prove yourself uh, because of the quality, because of the talent, motivation and everything that you can build as a culture, then you are unbeatable. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, good to remind ourselves and to remind our uh, young entrepreneurs uh, because uh, they all of them have one uh, unicorn still a toy in uh, uh, behind them uh, on the shelf uh, that uh, um, in addition to the hard product you need to build up this soft environment and always always to think that uh, you are on the world stage because of uh, your talent and uh, that you have something to do to the world, not uh, uh, being uh, second hand or to, to expect the support. Still, don't, those biases exist. And uh, what do you think? Uh, because uh, um, I'm extremely proud to be part of this uh, authentic uh, grassroots uh, built ecosystem of the uh, of the innovative uh, uh, business in Bulgaria. Uh, what more we can do collectively beyond uh, training and passing our own experience to the next generation of entrepreneurs? Uh, for elevating this uh, image uh, of uh, our country on the international stage. If you have any any ideas, uh, we'll be um, good to share here and to spread the tasks to our audience. Uh, sure. Uh, well, out of necessity, I would say, I, I had to figure out a way for myself to, to deal with those biases. People are not... Um, People don't mean bad. They, they, it's just how they were raised. So often in, in still in many organizations, the, the world of evaluating people, um, and the quality of what they do and the, the impact of their work is very subjective. And this is a huge problem because those biases then play a huge role into, um, drawing the picture of what is happening and where is it happening. Um, what worked really well for me is to, to put a lot of numbers behind, behind those things. Um, what is the health of the team? What is the performance of the team? What is the quality of the product? What is the quality of the technology? All of these things are measurable. And when you put the numbers in place, it becomes very clear who is performing well and who is not performing so well. And <clears throat> we've started that at Skyscanner. Skyscanner worked with a lot of data, but it was a process. It was evolving. Um, and when I joined Uber, I expected that being a bigger, more, how should I say, um, one of those organizations that are constantly under the, the spotlight, they would have a lot of things in, in that sense. And I would rather be learning than having to fight to put those things in place. I was terribly wrong, unfortunately. Um, so it took years to, to basically convince people that, that we need to, to, to do that. Um, but today, fortunately for me, we, we have it and, and it's, uh, 
drawing a picture that was very different from the perceptions that existed in the organization when I joined. Um, it, it clearly shows that the engineers in India are not performing less uh, worse than the engineers in the Silicon Valley. Um, it is showing a clear picture that the, 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 a, a small bunch of engineers in Sofia are actually outperforming everyone. Um, and, that, and that makes so much easier the job of someone to, to sell the location and to, to create um, solid material incentives for the organization to invest more into, into a place like Bulgaria. And then the more we, we spread the world around those things, the more this becomes the baseline, the, the standard for uh, how an organization operates, um, the better for us, because then more and more um, people with the right knowledge and skills uh, will be ending up in this location and that, will, that knowledge will be transferred to the local community and, and we shall be able to, to evolve much faster with respect to our um, the startup community and, and, and where we take things from there. Um, and I, that's one of the first things that I, that I, um, work with, not only with the organizations that I'm part of, but also the organizations that I'm advising, like put the numbers in place and, and trust the numbers. That's, that's the thing. And then it doesn't matter, like the command and control model then, then just dissolves because once you start seeing the numbers, there's clear transparency as to what is happening, how is it happening, what is happening well, how to replicate that. Um, and then you're no longer making the wrong decisions. You no longer need to track people. You no longer need to, to um, uh, require justification for everything that they are doing differently. Um, it's very clear to see that it's perfectly possible to have an amazing engineering team in a small place like Bulgaria and that it's not impossible to replicate what, what you build in Bulgaria into other places around the world. It's not in our genes to be good engineers, right? We've just learned whether from our mistakes, whether from some great people in, in, uh, in the industry or the community, and we've achieved something, we've, we've upgraded what we've learned to, to the next level. And, and replicating that is not even hard. Um, but the biggest problems that I had historically with with selling the story were related to subjectivity. So I think this is a powerful weapon and it's very easy for everyone to, to just utilize it. It's not expensive. It's, it doesn't require special skills. It just works really great. Actually, just to reconfirm what you said, uh... Uh, you returned me back in my memories in the early romantic days of HP. Uh, Bulgaria was totally invisible country because market was small. Um, always a shortage of uh, marketing money. Uh, always shortage of uh, investment in uh, headcounts. Uh, you know the corporate story. And then for just uh, two years, uh, we've... Uh, uh, contributed three years uh, with seven projects that uh, has been uh, a novelty on a worldwide level uh, from small Bulgaria. So we don't have a, a big qu quantity market wise and uh, everything that other had as an ammunition, but we've been yeah. and uh, brave and uh, those seven um, seven projects has been standardized in the HP's portfolio and then you have an open door then say aha those are these guys that uh, make the smart stuff so there are ways just to add to what uh, you said uh, very and I really thank you very much that uh, you especially refer to uh, data uh, based decision making I wish that our government would uh, uh, use this more in uh, the way how they take decisions, but uh, that's a topic for another uh, meetup. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, there is a way, uh, just we need to allow ourselves to think uh, with respect to what we, our people, and uh, can do in the context of adding value and having an impact in the corporate world and in the society. Uh, so I'm uh, looking in the uh, in the time, and uh, I really want uh, uh, 
uh, before opening for questions to ask you what's uh, up in Uber. Uh, can you disclose uh, what's happening, what's new in the company uh -huh. so that we take advantage of having you with us? Yeah, a lot is happening. Uh, actually, we, we were extremely worried about the whole situation uh, in 2020. Uh, fortunately for us, things are going back to normal much faster than, than we expected. And, and that allows us to sort of, uh, go back to the, the visionary side, the growth side of, of the story, rather than the protective side of the survival of the story. Right. Um, a lot of new acquisitions, a lot of new businesses have been acquired. We, we started hiring again, um. Sophia, by the way, we were, we were talking about how to sell the location and, and I think the numbers we've put in place were played a huge role into this because at the beginning, it was hard for me to fight for budgets as, as, as you mentioned to, to how, how to make the organization invest more in Sophia today. It's exactly the post, the, the, the opposite. They're, they're usually critical toward me that we're not hiring fast enough that we want to start like four new things. Um, and I have to push back because. As you said, there are pros, but there are cons as well. Like every location has those. Um, and we don't have an infinite pool of, of engineers and of product managers and of uh, people with experience in certain industries. Um, so it, it, there should be a balance. And, and uh, what's happening in Uber is, is, is amazing for us because it's both one of those organizations that like Uber is like 10 years old. Um, and, and it grew so fast that there's still that more or less chaotic, um, um, startup spirit, but, but the organization at the same time is maturing and is, um, starting to, to wrap up things around what is, what is the vision? What is the product? What are the, the, what the product will be in like 10 or 15 years. So there are so many things that, that are happening in terms of technology, in terms of product that. For us, this is a great time because when you're in that inflection point, when you've managed to sell the story of, of Sofia and Bulgaria, um, now you have also a choice. It's not uh, one of those cases where they will send the, uh, uh, boring stuff in the small cheap place. Uh, it's, it's rather the opposite. We're, we're, we're discussing getting more responsibility in Sofia around the, the critical path of, of the platform. Um, and the critical part of the platform, basically for, for the people that don't know is, um, there's a set of systems where one of those stops, the whole Uber stops, like all businesses of Uber stop. And so that's tens of millions of dollars of, of losses. So what, what we own here today is super critical for the organization, but, but they're also trusting us with, with that kind of impact, uh, for the future as well. Um, it also allows us to create diversity, like just a lot of the people in my team would are excited about things that are happening outside of Bulgaria in, in the organization. And, and those are opportunities to bring some of those here because unlike three years ago, when, when I was starting today, a lot of my peers are basically coming and asking, Hey, can I start a team in Sofia? And, and sometimes the answer is purely no, um, because. For different reasons, like, uh, recently, uh, the, the lady that was leading, that is leading the, the cognitive computing unit of, of Uber came and said, Hey, Alex, find me 20 engineers in Sofia that know, uh, speech synthesis and analysis. And, and I'm like, whoa, no way. Like th there's just no such talent in Sofia, but, um, she was still pretty excited. She said, well, I, what do you have there? And I said, well, the closest thing is like chat bots and. Uh, knowledge graphs and people, their whole teams with experience in the area. And she said, like, bring them on board. Um, so we are still figuring out how to connect the success of, of the organization with, with, uh, the next stage for, for Sophia. But there, the, the important thing for me here is that one, we have a choice so we can choose what to bring in Sophia, because there's a lot of opportunities. A lot of people want to come here Two, um, that, that. Whatever we bring in Sophia will be super critical for the organization. Once people start seeing the numbers, nobody wants to invest their best engineers into, um, secondhand experimental projects, right? That, uh, nine out of 10 will be killed. They want those engineers to be responsible for what's really critical for the business. And the cost is, uh, is, is a factor here. Um, 
an engineer in Sofia costs three times less than, than an engineer in, in the Bay Area. And so uh, combined with the quality of, of what they're getting in terms of talent here, uh, the organization is super excited. At the same time, we, we want to continue keeping the bar high and, and with the limited uh, pool of people that, that we have in, in, in Sofia, that makes things hard. This team will probably never be 2,000 or 3,000 engineers. Um, simply because I don't think that that I don't know maybe maybe in ten years if we're doing the right things in the community if we are spreading the right knowledge from the very universities um, that will be a sort of the the, the place to be uh, when you're building engineering teams but there are limitations as well. Uh, actually, the limitations are quite visible. I have a friend uh, who founded the company um, two years ago, and they are um, between UK and Bulgaria. They operate, and they are one of the uh, one of the producer of solutions for Amazon. And um, recently, he was visiting me, and uh, he said that for him is cheaper. Uh, to hire an engineer in the UK, in London, uh, than in Bulgaria today for specific uh, areas. So maybe uh, this three times cheaper is not uh, so much valid anymore, especially for special skills, if you want to have an advanced engineering skills. So one of the tasks, as you said, is uh, we to use this, the capacity and experience that we have in the right way so that uh, we train people uh, with the resources, shared resources of the community. And by the way, this is happening in a, in a good way, in my view. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. There is a lot that can be done in the universities still, because uh, if you want the big flow should come uh, from there, although uh, there is an improvement already there in the public-private uh, concepts, but uh, uh, what the industry is giving back to the community in terms of uh, engineering knowledge is amazing. I'm, I have a very big respect about the, the maturity, if you want, of our, uh, of our sector at the moment. Uh, I, One, I agree uh, with you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. One last... the, the benefit of, of having a small community is that everyone knows everyone. And so you always know what is missing somewhere and, and you can connect the right people. Yeah. Um, plus, the other piece here is that a lot of people left the country in, in the 90s specifically and and they've spent like 20 years in the in the valley. There is still knowledge that is just missing here. There is experience that is missing here. Uh, 10 years ago, it was very hard for me to, to convince any one of these people to come back to Bulgaria. Now, now it's very different. Like we've, we've brought back, I don't know, probably around 10 people uh, uh, from Western Europe and, and the United States during just the last five or six years and more and more are asking, hey, um, how does Bulgaria look like? Many of those people don't don't even remember. They, they are not going to, to recognize the place. Um, and and it's also related to largely to, to a government policy, like uh, making, making sure that not only Bulgarians can return to Bulgaria, uh, fixing things around taxes, fixing things around our administration, around visas, um, is very important to bring that talent to Sofia and to, to enrich the community. And and I think that it's it's going to be a crucial step to to going to the next level where we shall be able to build those one, two thousand men teams for for the Amazons and the Facebooks and etc. Yeah, hopefully soon uh, there are, uh, there is a light in the tunnel, but uh, things are slower good. than yeah, a bit slow. <laughs> uh, last question from me: uh, How you hack yourself? You do many things like Shiva professionally, privately, feeding children. Also, uh, is your specialty in la in last couple of months? But uh, how you recharge? How I recharge? I read a lot, and I read uh, stupid books, like mostly sci-fi. Um, it's very hard for me to to go to sleep without uh, going through a couple of pages. Uh, so, sci-fi is definitely saving my my life, uh, with respect to sanity, at least. Um, I have I come with a uh, from a physics background, so uh, my dream has always been to 
go back there. So I've spent a little money on, on a decent telescope and, and there are amazing, those are amazing times for, for science as well. Like when I was talking about uh, teaching my kids to code, this is just one of many things that we do with them. Like I'm teaching them biology and, and physics and, and astronomy and, and a bunch of other things. I think that the richer the exposure uh, to uh, they have at, at this early age, will will basically get them to to figure out how interesting the world is and 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 to to be to have the incentives to to just jump out there and pick something that that excites them and uh figure out what is what is their thing um but yeah uh, i'm i'm truly hoping that uh, i will soon retire and and i will uh, probably do many many different things i want to sell i want to uh, build autonomous farms and, and and a bunch of other things. So, and it's exciting times because there are so many cool startups in Sofia today. So, we'll see. We can partner in building uh, autonomous farm because that's also what uh, drives me as the next project. So, oh right, I'm bringing <laughs> San Francisco to do that with us here. Uh, okay. So there's there's a huge opportunity there. For me, it's going to be a problem, mm -hmm. but. We already have Nasekomo. We already have uh, a bunch of cool Bulgarian startups that are doing some amazing stuff, and and some people in the valley that have a lot of experience with robotics and other things, uh, hydroponics. So I have I've I've met this amazing guy who is who is currently a director of engineering at Roblox. He's a Bulgarian, one of those Bulgarians that left the countries way back, um, and. We've been talking about building something like that for for ages now, and he wants to come back to Bulgaria, and, and I'm hoping that we shall we shall make some amazing talks. But but we are really excited about building something that can grow food automatically on the moon. Uh, you know, we shall be aiming at like what's gonna be the next thing in 50 years, not in 10. Uh, so it's really interesting times. Space tech is is booming. We we have good presence there. In the community, in the startup community in Sofia as well. So, very, very interesting times, and and a lot of opportunities. And I think that if we set the right stage for for girls, I mean, my girl will have so many cool opportunities in in her life compared to to myself. That I sometimes just envy her. We just need to properly prepare them for for that world, and and to prepare the world around us to to take them and and to accelerate the, the, their their capacity to to levels that that will bring more and more value for for not just bulgaria the world in general and maybe also to think on uh, how we can support those girls that doesn't uh, have the privilege uh, their parents to show them early uh in the in life uh, the opportunities that can they can uh, choose and pick because they are equally talented and gifted children absolutely and um one of the things to uh try generalize uh the on the topic of what we do for girls for boys what we do for women uh, and uh, uh why we are uh, also having a dialogue on uh, how the society can evolve is because of the fact that we had a chance to uh, take uh, and to, to be exposed to, to a first class world experience. And uh, I personally believe that we have responsibilities uh, towards the others, the next generation, the, those that are underprivileged and uh, and of course, to build the farm uh, in space uh, for the next 50 years, of course. <laughs> well, okay, let's... so uh, Alex, uh, we can continue for um, another one hour, but our time is over. I will just uh, open uh, to the audience for one or two questions if uh, uh, someone uh, wants to raise a hand. We don't have anything in the chat, but uh, of course uh, you all are uh, invited to make your reflections or to take advantage of uh, having Alex with me tonight. Yeah, go folks. Be brave. I love the, the hard question, so shoot them.
a shy audience. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think anybody um, has a question. Maybe we covered uh, such a big portfolio of uh, topics, although on the surface, so that people are um, having enough food to to reflect and. Um, uh, being uh, conscious about the time because everybody had a long day and uh, I bet uh, uh, three, four, so of three. Uh, okay yes please uh, hi Alex uh, I would like to hear your opinion there is that strange thing that <clears throat> there are so many uh, so, um, so many so so much money in going into the industry into things that immediately su support our current lifestyle and then we can obviously see what Elon Musk is doing and there is that huge gap in between <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned autonomous farms and stuff like this which are to me at least seem so much more close and useful for the immediate life that we have on earth than putting a yeah. set of mars well so, stan i uh, sorry uh, finish finish uh yeah, that, finish. That's okay. why well, that I think, I think that with and and i've been doing this with everything i i i'm a strong believer in 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 being agile and, and delivering iteratively and so I was I was recently speaking with one of the uh, VC managers that that I'm working with, um, and and I was telling him that that I'm going to retire and do all these crazy things, and he says like uh, I'll, I'll provide the money, and I said no no no, listen you don't understand this is going to be a hobby this is my retirement right, um, but he was basically saying if you're building something that can autonomously uh, uh, produce food on on the moon. Where are you going to experiment that this actually works? And I said, well, I'll bury it underground and, and it will only count on um, a fixed uh, supply of water and only sun as a source of energy. And he said, well, can you build that in like 10 stories underground? Can we build farms in the desert? Can we build farms in, uh, in Siberia? And it never, it never occurred to me, but, but he's right. Like, there are people who just think this way. They 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 are ready to invest into an idea that will probably fruition in fifty years. But they are already thinking, how am I to make money out of this in in five years, in ten years, in fifty years? And we know that the population of of the earth is is growing rapidly, and that we shall have a problem with clean water, and that we shall have a problem with food. Um, and so there are stages like if we want to produce food on the moon let's start producing that food on 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 earth and a lot of those places are very inhospitable places and we're not using them for anything if it can be automated if it doesn't require that people are there and taking care of it um then we can grow food anywhere um and and it creates opportunities now is someone going to be crazy enough to to invest into something like that I think that what you've mentioned about Musk is, is important here, or Bezos, or all of these guys. Um, the world 20 years ago would never invest into an idea like that. Today, they're all super hyped about it, right? And so I think that the proving that something can be successful um, makes those hungry investors uh, want to be part of the story um, 10 years from now rather than tomorrow or a year from now. So I think there are opportunities. We just need to think the right way about how to how to get there. And as I said, for me, it's going to be a hobby. But if if someone who has the money and the interest to invest into something like this is interested, I told him like I'm I'm more than happy to just transfer the IP to you and and you figure out how to set up a team and scale that. Um, I'm I'm just going to be enjoying generating those ideas. And there are so many things that we can disrupt today. Like the, the, the opportunities are infinite. Um, we have uh, also another question, uh, but just to add a sentence on uh, what you said, because uh, it's not only about how we will make money uh, and be the champions now for the future. The truth is that um, the uh, we are not good citizens of the Mother Earth, and. Um, 
there are real risks related to climate. Um, we have uh, the UN statistics that uh, advises that um, about 250 million climate refugees uh, uh, will look for livable place uh, in just 30 years from now. So, uh, food, housing, uh, innovative way we to do what we are doing for ourselves uh, becomes very critical. And um, the, um, if not the private investors, uh, for sure, the institutional investors are looking for solutions. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the moon is an option, but uh, I would be happy <laughs> to see also the fields uh, around Sofia uh, well equipped with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, yeah, Sasha, unfortunately, it might be easier to put that on the moon than uh, around Sofia. Yeah, 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 maybe. Course, like, if you look at, uh, this is the other thing that I was discussing with a couple of folks in, in the Valley and recently in Sofia. If you look at the startup scene in, in Israel and what the country is doing to support that, it is crazy. It's like an Israeli guy, I think, told me that they are investing 2% of their GDP into uh, accelerating startups. Um, and that is already paying off. They have so many unicorns there. Uh, why a country like Bulgaria cannot do something? Not at their scale, uh, but we are same size, not not much more rich in, in the resources. We just have right people. And we need to use that. And, and someone in the government needs to start thinking about those things because that money will, will return to the Israeli government in, in 10 or 20 years, like, 100x um and just we need to just be strategic and practical mm -hmm. uh let's maybe give a floor uh, uh we'll stay for a few more minutes but uh stasi king uh was raising hand she also put uh, uh her uh her question in the in the chat stasi you want to uh, ask the question yourself or I should uh, read it for you. So. Thanks, Vlad. Oh. She uh, left? Uh, okay, because we are uh, about the time. I know because okay. uh, I'll, I'll people have been. I'll to uh, get in touch with her and, and discuss. But uh, yes and no. Um, uh, yes, because uh, there are things that we are doing on a regular basis. No, because I don't think they are big enough. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, 2020 specifically uh, was very hard year for Uber, and so we cut budgets in a lot of places. Um, but we've discussed some amazing things, and, and I see the support from the community here uh, inside Uber, and uh, we were thinking of... I, I've, I've always been passionate uh, about uh, doing more in the high schools and uh, um, early education in primary school. Um, and I and I met some really amazing supporters in San Francisco around that. So hopefully, hopefully, um, very soon we shall be able to um, loosen our pockets a little bit and, and start planning on how to how to do something like that. Um, but there's so much more that we can do. Uh, I don't think we're doing. Yeah. Okay, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a good discussion that we had. Uh, also, I went uh, fast through the feedback in the chat uh, for some people that uh, uh, left a bit earlier. So very good uh, uh, feedback also uh, coming from there. So uh, we did a good job. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, uh hopefully we teased uh, with this dialogue uh, everybody who was with us tonight and uh, those that will follow this session uh, in uh, our channels also uh, we have a post podcast uh, in whatever channel you're using uh, you can uh, follow it so hopefully we have provoked a positive uh, wipe wipe and uh yeah Let's uh, let's stay in touch and thank you everybody for being with us tonight. Absolutely. Um, Sasha, it was a, yeah, Sasha, it was a pleasure again. Uh, I hope that uh, we do a lot of those uh, in the near future. And uh, good luck with what you're doing. This is amazing. 
Super. Thank you. And uh, to everybody, have a nice week. week uh, no, not weekend, not yet. Uh, nice evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Thanks for being with us, folks. Bye. Have a great time.